Welcome to session 12 of our Coffee with Coral webinar series. In this video, we talk to Mike Madden from Trinity Industries about their brand new mash tested React M crash cushion. Don't forget to view our other webinars and get notified on new videos by subscribing to our channel and hitting the notification bell. Let's join the session. So I did want to mention or just tell you that, uh, you know, I have a background uh, that includes WashDOT. I worked for WashDOT from 92 to 99. Um, and actually my relationship, I guess, with Coral Sales goes all the way back then when I, uh, I took an installation training class on what was called the GREAT system. So we were working on the 405, 520 rebuild in uh, the early mid nineties. And uh, that was before NCHRP 350. So they were actually installing an NCHRP 230 crash cushion on one of the exit ramps. I think it was 124th street in Bellevue there or 124th Avenue. Um, and I think that was maybe only crash cushion on the project, but in any event, uh, the NCHRP 350 requirements came along in the mid nineties, 95, 96 is about when they were implemented. They kind of got pushed down the state's throats by the FHWA uh, for lack of a better description. The states didn't necessarily like that um, because they weren't given any extra funding to upgrade these devices. Um, and so when MASH came out, MASH originally came out in 2009, roughly, um, the states were not required to adopt it. Um, it was uh, essentially adopted and the feds handed it off to AASHTO. So AASHTO is now essentially the owner of the MASH compliance guidelines and they have partnered with the FHWA to uh, set out implementation uh, dates and, and such. And, and those are all here pretty much now. Um, unfortunately, the, uh, the product offerings aren't always uh, complete um, in various you know, groups of products. Uh, I know sign supports, there's still a lot of questions. But with crash cushions, we've been charging ahead and... Uh, it took a little longer than we would hoped, but we, we were able to get the React uh, completed uh, through the MASH testing this fall. Um, we're very careful in preparing all the test reports and reviewing them. And uh, so we did get those uh, all completed and ready for submittal to the FHWA, which we did early this year. And uh, we have started to submit this to the states, including Washington. Um, at this time, and I'll talk about it a little bit, but we don't have our FHWA letter on this product uh, yet. We would expect to get it um, sometime maybe around the end of April if they stay consistent with their review timeframe. And uh, that's just kind of where we're at as far as the MASH compliance on this. Um, but I'll run through this product. Uh, we're excited about this product. It's a a new version, if you will, of the React system, very similar to a lot of the features, but we feel we've made a lot of improvements and we have a, a neat product that uh, will meet the needs of the DOTs, uh, both from a, you know protecting the motorists as well as the maintenance uh, of these systems, because obviously that's a, a big component and, a, and a, a real benefit of the React system. So. We call it the newest member of the React family. Uh, so it's a redirective non-gating crash cushion. Uh, it's gonna redirect just you know at the front edge of this or the front side of this front cylinder. Um, this has all been tested to MASH 16, the TL3 speed requirement at you know, essentially 62 miles per hour or 100 kilometers per hour. But what sets this React system apart from some of the other low maintenance systems that are out there is the self restoring characteristics. So you'll see some of that in the performance crash tests that I'll show you. But this system has the ability to uh, self restore or kind of reset itself and uh, provide residual capacity after an impact, even though. It just got hit. It uh, and sometimes these happen in threes as far as the impacts on these attenuators. So if maintenance doesn't have a chance to get out there and repair and reset the system, um, it still has some capacity to take an impact. And I think that's an important feature 
especially in, uh, you know, tight urban areas where it's real difficult to get out there and maintain these systems. Um, so we'll, we'll go through that and talk about that more. Um, as far as this presentation, I'll go through a product description, talk about the components uh, and kind of look at them, you know, versus the original React system that WashDOT has plenty of out there in the field. We'll talk about applications, how it's assembled uh, and installed on a site, uh, talk about maintenance of the system, and just kind of the, the key takeaways from this presentation. So, so what's the first thing you'll notice that's different about this as a test level three device, the old React 350 had nine cylinders and we've actually gone through and made it more efficient and we've uh, reduced the cylinder count down to six cylinders. So there are six high density polyethylene, uh, I believe it's called a high molecular weight polyethylene. Um, and it sits, those cylinders sit on a base track. There's actually two rails that run up each side and the, the cylinders are resting on that. Um, and then we have the cables that run up each side of it. But this system is designed to shield objects up to 30 inches wide. Um, there is a way to offset the system depending on the traffic configuration to protect a hazard that's 33 inches wide with the three inch offset. And, uh, you know, we can talk more about that. Uh, just one of the things to point out to particularly design engineers, anytime you're looking at a, a project location where you have a specific hazard, we offer design services at no charge to analyze the site, make recommendations, even provide layout and uh, site specific drawings to detail what we would recommend for an installation site. So um, the system weighs uh, 5,000 pounds roughly. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty big load for a contractor to take off a truck and, and install on the site, but it's, it's relatively simple as far as the installation goes because it comes fully assembled. Um, and we want it to be installed on a, a new or existing concrete pad and it uses 36 anchors. And I'll, I'll detail those more as we go through this. But here's the major components of the system. Uh, start at the back of the system. Uh, we have the self-contained steel backup. And most of the systems in Washington are that same system, but we've, we've changed this backup. We've widened it out. We've simplified it. And we do believe we've improved the uh, ability to tension the cables better, uh, making it easier to, to do so and easier to tighten uh, them to the proper taut is what we uh, ask for as far as the, uh, the tension of them. Um, again, there's base tracks that run underneath the system and that's, that's what's anchored to the foundation pad as well as that self-contained backup. And then one thing that's new with this React system is these uh, diaphragms and you can't really see them very well in this picture. You can kind of see right here. So it's, a, and I'll show you a close up of them but there's a diaphragm between each cylinder that helps uh, in the redirective capabilities of the system. Uh, and there's two ways it helps. It, it supports the cable more, th more so throughout the system. And it also has what we call guides. So there's a guide, an internal guide on the diaphragm that sits between the two rails. And then there's an outer guide you see here. And it's a small piece that helps uh, with the redirective capabilities of the system. Again, we have the high molecular weight, high density polyethylene cylinders throughout the system. And then uh, typically with the REACTS, we have a nose cover and we have designs for left or right uh, shoulder applications as well as gore applications. So I'll just kind of keep going here. So this is the, the base track and the backup shown as, as one system here. Um, what we did with this new system though, is we allowed for the separation of these two through a bolted connection. So if there ever is any damage maybe to the backup and that would take quite, a, quite an impact, but we all know semis can hit these things and, and that they're not tested to uh, take the abuse of a semi impact at freeway speeds. Or if the, for some reason the, the track itself, which is very unlikely would ever get damaged or, or pull up in any way, 
that can be replaced separately. As you get into the cylinder design, again, there's six cylinders, but every single one of them is different. Um, for you know, just an example, the the cables one, or I mean, the cylinders one, three, and five all have a cable guide bracket attached to it. Um, and again, that's for these cables to run up each side of the system. But each cylinder is unique. Um, you'll see the front two cylinders have what we call spacers in them. Those are steel tubes at the top of the system, and that prevents that cylinder from uh, crushing too far and getting too flat and uh, taking too much, uh, I guess, force on the and causing the crease to to split and break in the cylinder itself. Um, these cylinders you'll see here have laminates inside them as well. Some of them do. This number two cylinder, as well as four, five, and six. So those are designed to stiffen the system and again, provide more efficiency through a, a stiffer cylinder at the back here, or as you move to the back of the system. And then, you know, some of the differences are just the bolting of the system, again, where a bracket's attached or where it attaches to, this will attach to the backup. Um, and then each cylinder is attached to each other as well through the diaphragms. So uh, the material is the same as the 350 version. So it's essentially that same or is that same material, but the 350 and mass cylinders are not interchangeable. These again are, are unique and we have a, you know, each assembly is called out as a separate number of where it lies in the system. And then we do offer the cylinder covers. Uh, we did not do all the testing with the, the cylinder covers. But they're a soft uh, kind of a tarpaulin material that uh, we feel is inconsequential to the crash performance of the system. But we know in certain areas they like to have those covers. Um, so we want to be able to offer those as well. So again, here's that diaphragm system that is uh, in the middle of the uh, in between each cylinder. And it's, it's a steel frame, welded frame. It's kind of in a triangular shape here, but it has these are also high density polyethylene panels that attach to each side. And that's where the, the cable will contact the diaphragm. These diaphragms also have a, a inner guide here to help sliding back and resisting uh, angle impacts. And then they have what we call an outer guide. So, I just want to make sure everybody still hear me. Can somebody confirm that? Yes, we can hear you. Loud and clear. Okay. So, something happened on my screen. I just wanted to make sure that uh, I wasn't talking to myself. So, <laughs> and there you can see the outer guide uh, that that connects to the diaphragm, and that's an integral part of the the redirective components. It's also somewhat of a sacrificial part. So on a full scale, you know, mash design type impact, these will often bend and they'll, they'll flare up, if you will, um, and they'll need to be replaced, but it, it's a relatively simple part, takes just a few minutes to replace and, and also a relatively inexpensive part. But we kind of designed that into the system because with the mash testing, you need uh, significant, you know, strength to resist that angle impact at 25 degrees. And uh, we wanted to, you know, we, we use this to do that. But again, uh, in the design of the system, this may fail and may need replacement after a angle type impact. So there's the inner guide I mentioned. So there's just kind of an end on look. So you can see the rails of the base track here. And this kind of floats on there. It's not, you know, a tight fit, um, but it is designed to interact with the the rails on a redirective impact also will help the system slide back in a controlled manner and uh, capture the vehicle in an off-center type impact. So this new REACT-M uh, uses four cables, or at least they appear as four cables on each side of the system. It's actually uh, two cables that run from a, a wedge fitting here 
up to the front of the system. They loop through a pin up here at the front and then they run to the back. And then you have a threaded rod with a washer and nut to tighten the system. And then you have the same thing on the bottom cables, again, with a single cable that runs back and forth. Um, so we have effectively four cables on each side of the system. It's uh, slightly different than the existing React 359 cylinders that WashDOTs used. They typically just have two, two cables running up each side. So here you can see the backup. Um, and again, that allows for an easier tightening of the system. You have to hold the, the assembly here, and then you're going to tighten the nut and washer on the back of the system to keep those cables taut, which we say if you're pushing down with 100 pounds of pressure, they shouldn't deflect more than about two inches. Hey, Mike. So, yeah. I got a quick question for you. Um, are, we got a question that came in. Are the cylinders open on the bottom? Yes, the cylinders are open on the bottom, yes. Perfect, thank you. Yep. So here's just the different you know, nose covers. And again, these help uh, the motorists see these and hopefully avoid them out in the field. Um, the gore area splits traffic. This one can be turned 90 degrees to uh, represent a left or a right application. So we call it the universal cover. Here's some other parts. Um, again, we offer small delineators to attach to the side of the system uh, to bring delineation, you know, and we offer a, a yellow and a white to match the road striping configuration on whether it's on the left or the right side of the road. Um, here's an important tool for maintenance. So this is the, the pull-out assembly tool. So this will slide inside the front cylinder this eye bolt here will go through the nose cover through the cylinder itself. And that is how you pull out the system. You'll hook a, a chain with a hook on it to this system. You want to pull the system to its original length and hold it for 10 to 15 minutes. And that should set the memory of these cylinders back to uh, real close to the original configuration. <clears throat> and uh, so this is the debris cover you see here. So again, it's a soft tarpaulin type material. It'll attach with self-tapping screws into the cylinder itself. <clears throat> so again, this is a, you know, again, to prevent debris or snow from falling into the inside of the cylinder. This uh, little reflector here also attaches with self-tapping screws that just screw into the, the high-density polyethylene cylinders. And Mike, we have one, another question that came through. So yeah. does the system have an indica indicator like the QuadGuard Elite system so maintenance can easily see that the attenuator has been hit? It does expected. not at this time. Um, we haven't developed anything like that. I'm not sure how they could do that after the fact that we crash tested it. That would probably be hard to hard to do. A lot of times you'll see scarring on the nose cover if there has been an impact. Um, you can also kind of note and, and look at the, the alignment of the cylinders on the base track because if it's offset somewhat, that could mean that it has uh, been impacted on the side. But at this, at this point, we do not have a impact indicator. So the transitions that we offer, so, you know, this is a standalone system. So if you would have, say you have a, a 10 inch or 12 inch uh, vertical concrete wall behind this, you can just put this in front of it uh, in a simple application up to even 30 inches wide. Um, so this is a, a standalone in front of uh, many hazards. Um, but if you want to use this in a median application, um, you may have traffic coming on the backside of it. So that's when we need to get into transitions. And, and we do have one specific design for a vertical wall that's 30 inches wide. And I'll, I'll show you those in a minute here. So again, as long as this is offset to fully protect this hazard, so it's behind the backup. And, and this allows for a wider hazard protection with this wider backup that we now have, because we widened it significantly. And again, kind of simplified the, the setup. Um, but you, you can offset this to fully protect this hazard in most cases up to 30 inches 
or even 33 inches wide. Um, if you're in a unidirectional application and you have a 30 inch wide hazard, we offer these small panels that attach to the side of the system. And I'll show you kind of a mock-up picture of that. And then again, for reverse direction traffic, we have a thri-beam transition for vertical walls and then a W-beam transition for uh, safety shape and single slope type concrete barriers. So these, these again will protect a vehicle from sliding or hitting the, the back side of the system here and, and getting snagged on this backup and uh, you know causing damage and, and not uh, safely stopping the vehicle. So here's just again that uh, picture of the 30 inch wide concrete wall with those panels. Here's a, a mock-up of the tri-beam transition for vertical walls. And then we have the W-beam transition for safety shape type barriers. One thing we note here or show in this drawing to emphasize, if this is a portable concrete barrier and you're coming into the back of a system, if, if you have the ability to get hit from behind here, this needs to be anchored because this barrier can easily slide and then you would get pocketing and potential impact into the back of the system. So we show our anchor plates here that are actually installed on both sides. So there's a total of six anchor plates to uh, stabilize and secure a portable concrete barrier section at the back of a, a REACT system. And, and it's the same for the quad guard system if you're familiar with that. Hey, Mike, we got, we got another question. Um, okay. So, you know, knowing that the cylinders are open, could uh, any debris that builds up inside of them affect the functionality? Uh, it depends on what type of debris. I mean, there, there's an amazing amount of force that it's put on these during an impact. Um, certain, you know, if somebody, and I hate to say it, but I see sometimes, and I don't know if it's road crews that pick stuff up, but they'll, they'll actually put like uh, a big four by four piece of wood in these sometimes, or, or uh, they'll lay it right by it um, if they're clearing it off the road. So if it's something, you know, like a four by four piece of wood, it, it could impact the performance to the system. Um, you know, something steel or something that's, uh, you know, a, a real stiff, rigid material. If it's, you know, snow, um, most likely it's not going to impact the performance of the system. You know, ice, on the other hand, could potentially uh, affect the system. So it kind of depends on your, you know, the climate you're in and, and where you're at and what kind of debris you would expect. I mean, soda cans, dirt debris shouldn't be a problem. And typically these systems will just uh, slide through that or, or slide over it possibly. Again, there's a little bit of give about two inches in the, the diaphragm uh, connection to the, the base tracks. So hopefully that answers the questions or give you an idea of what how the system will work. So that kind of just goes through a quick run hey, down of the system. Yeah. I have another question too. So um, just coming through, do you have covers available for the system if the department wants it? Uh, yeah, we do. We it, It's the same cover that's been used most recently on the REACT uh, 350 system. Again, they're typically they're attached with self-tapping screws into the top of the cylinder. And uh, yeah, those are readily available. Perfect. So again, this just talks about the, the diaphragms and the base track and how they interact again. And again, these are an important part of the redirective capabilities of the system, as well as the four cables. So the old React, here you can see kind of the comparison of the two. Um, the system was actually connected through two separate parts. This is one solid piece all the way back. Um, but you can see the difference in the backups here, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But uh, this one's, for one, much wider, but it's also uh, been simplified in a way. There's a, a gearing inside this one that allowed to you to pull this uh, pulley connection back to stretch the cable. 
and make sure they stay taut. Um, now we've just got a, a threaded rod with a nut to tighten the system cables and, and that I think is much more friendly. With the nine cylinder system, you are actually up to 56 anchors. Uh, with this new React M, we're at 36 anchors. So you have fewer anchor studs required during an installation. And with this system, and a lot of people don't realize it when you see it out in the field, but there is a there's a steel rod that runs back on the back of the system here. And there's actually kind of like mini diaphragm, this little steel plate with uh, a chain attached to it that hooks onto that cable. And that helps with the redirective right at the back of the React 350. But our new diaphragm and, and guide system has replaced that. And again, we feel that's a simplification and an improvement to the system. Hey, Mike, got yeah. another question coming through. Um, so these, the React barrels, um, about how many impacts can they take before they need to be replaced? You know, th that's a real difficult question. We've seen, you know, some sites, and this is going back to the React 350 because we don't have a lot of field experience with this React M yet, but we've seen, you know, 20 and 30 impacts in certain areas. I know Houston, Texas, they just love the React and they've used them all over their area. And I believe they, they had counted in one case over 30 impacts. It depends what hits it though, you know, because these are again, you know, designed uh, on the crash test criteria to take the impact of a 5,000 pound pickup truck going 62 miles per hour or the small car as well. Um, but, you know, what hits it in the field is really gonna determine on design impacts, you should get a, a long life I, I don't want to put a number on it, but I'd say, you know, at least several impacts and probably, uh, you know, a dozen or more impacts that are somewhat standard and not over capacity. Perfect. So this, uh, this just, uh, I just talked about this, but again, you can kind of see with that little steel plate and the chains of, of how the redirective uh, capabilities were as, improved or, or carried out on the React 350 type system. Again, we've got away from that with our diaphragm system. And again, our new backup one can be detached from the monorail or the guide, the, the base track system, but it's also wider. So it makes it easier to protect wider hazards. It's less complex. So this is all just a steel piece. There's no working parts. Again, the only working part is a threaded rod that has a nut tightened on it. Whereas this, again, there's gearing inside here that you can't see, but it, there's bolts back here that you would use to tighten the system. And they're a little hard to reach. And uh, the connection of the system is a lot easier. I know reaching down, cause this cylinder is actually connected to the, the backup. Uh, unbolting that, if you ever need to do that is very difficult with this old React design, with the new React design, you can see it's very easily accessible to disconnect that cylinder if it would ever need to be replaced. So here, uh, and I talk about, well, we show the React 2 in a lot of these slides. The React 2 is a product that Washington never utilized because they have six cylinder systems out there that are rated at 55 miles per hour from the React 350 design. They didn't want to confuse the matter. Um, so that's why you see a lot of comparisons with the React 2. So this product is not has not been used in, in Washington state. But again, the React M does use six cylinders. And here you can see kind of an overhead view. And again, with different thicknesses, hole, panner, hole patterns and laminations, the design is similar, but the, the system itself is slightly different. And again, tightening the cables is a lot simpler process with this new React MASH system. So we just kind of talk about what kind of applications would most fit the React M, you know, high traffic areas, especially ones that are, are hard to access, uh, high impact areas. 
I know Washington DOT used to have a the 18 month, I believe was the criteria if you expected an impact more than once every 18 months, you definitely want to go to a low maintenance system. I think, you know, the whole Seattle urban area could probably can be considered that uh, type of setting. Um, I know the the Eastern District over in Spokane, they really like the REACT. They have quite a few of them installed on I-90 and a few other uh, state routes around this area. Um, so again, bi-directional median areas, and then the Gore area. And again, that's usually a high traffic area, um, but it works well in the Gore area. Just looking at uh, installing one of these on site. Um, again, typically with our foundation pads, we don't want to see more than an eight degree cross slope on these systems. We can allow some twist, if you will, in the system, but we don't want to see the super elevation of the pad change more than 2% over the length of the pad. And here we're showing a four foot wide by 23 foot long, eight inch deep reinforced concrete pad. I, I believe it's 54 inches. So I, I'm, I'm, I didn't catch this when I was going through this originally, but it's a 4,000 PSI concrete. Uh, Again, just for the long-term life of these systems and the pad itself, we recommend reinforcement. Here you can see a uh, concrete pad without an anchor block. And if so, we ask for an anchor block with these systems if this system is not up against a rigid uh, hazard. So if this is a, a concrete barrier with a foundation, then an eight inch concrete pad is acceptable. If you're attaching to a non-rigid or semi-rigid, like a, a guardrail or a thri-beam type structure, or there is a, a portable concrete barrier coming up to the back of the REACT, then we recommend you use an anchor block because the forces are so great that these pads can actually slide when impacted by a, well, pickup truck at uh, 62 miles per hour, but more likely, you know, an overcapacity impact of, of a larger vehicle at a high speed. So we want to kind of over design these so that uh, you won't have any long term problems with the pad. So a contractor who's installing the system or a maintenance group, they're going to, you know, definitely need something that uh, meets the 6000 pound minimum capacity. You're going to use a crane or boom truck. There's lifting points identified. And they'll prevent the, the system from tipping. So here we make a note too, when you're setting this system, the steel backup base plate should be two inches in front of any type of roadside obstacle. So when they go to anchor the system, again, we use a, a seven inch anchor stud, seven eighths inch diameter that is five and a half inches deep into the concrete foundation. So this system uses 36 anchors. We have a little warning here that every anchor hole should be filled with an anchor and then a washer and nut attaching it to the foundation pad. So it's relatively straightforward to get this installed. The one thing a contractor or maintenance crew would need or preferably have is a, a socket extension so you don't have to work around the cables on the side. So you can actually go down through this area here with your uh, ratchet gun to tighten that anchor stud. Again, here I just talk about the tensioning the cables. So th those cables are not tensioned when the system shipped from the factory. So once it's installed in the field and everything's anchored down, then you want to come back and make sure these are tightened uh, in what we call taut, which is uh, two inches of uh, deflection when you use 100 pounds of pressure on the cables. So they, they don't have to be a high tension by any means, but they, they need to be tight. 
and and run you know kind of level up the side of the system that's what you will prefer to see so again at some point these systems when they're impacted over and over again may have a, a situation where you need to repair or replace the cylinders so we have a couple of rules of thumb uh, when the cylinder is compressed and won't come back more than an 18 inch in the, the direction of the center line of the system, then that cylinder would need to be replaced. We also say if the system does not reach out to 90% of the original length, when it's pulled out, then you would need to look at the cylinders and determine which one, you know, or maybe a couple or several need to be replaced. But that gives you, you know, some guidance and criteria on when these cylinders would need to be replaced. So why the, why the REACT MASH? Well, it's been tested fully to the MASH 16 test level three requirements. It's a redirective non-gating crash cushion. Many of these components are potentially reusable on design impacts. It's a self-restoring system. So it has that capability on, on the typical type MASH design impacts. Uh, it's a simple design, you know, very few parts will wear or break. The parts that do are easily repairable and low cost. Manufactured and distributed through the in the USA. And uh, the deployment, the sites or the, the units arrive assembled on site, and that simplifies the installations for the contractors or the maintenance crews. Hey Mike. Mike yeah. We got another <clears throat> another question. So the cylinders are different size. Does the 18 inch replacement rule apply to all the cylinders regardless of their size? The cylinders are all 36 inch diameter cylinders. So it's uh, the, the size is the same. It's the bolt patterns for spacers, for instance, or laminates or how they connect to, you know, whether it's the backup or an intermediate cylinder. So that, that's how they're all different, but they are all 36 inch diameter. So the, the 18 inch rule would apply to every cylinder throughout. Perfect. Does that answer the question? I believe so. Okay. I just kind of wanted to run through the various uh, product information we have available. Um, we have just product information sheets, a little marketing brochure with the front and back page. We have the product manual and, and you can actually go out to trinityhighway.com, uh, look at MASH products and, and you can go to product documents and you can download the PI sheets, the product manual. Um, on site specific locations, we do customer drawings to identify all the parts and pieces that are used particularly in any transitions that are required. Uh, we have specifications for the materials and the system itself. We've got all the FHWA uh, test reports that were submitted. Um, those are all done by an independent testing lab, a uh, lab called CARCO down in Southern California. So there's no affiliation between Trinity Highway and the testing lab. Uh, you'll see actually they, they test quite a few of the industry systems that are out there available as MASH crash cushions. Uh, we've got crash test videos, which you're able to see some of today. Um, and of course we've got pricing available. I will just say, you know, we feel this is a premium system. Um, it has features that no other system has. And so the prices is, is in the higher end of the crash cushion array, along with some of the other systems that you, you have out there. Um, that are low maintenance. Um, and we are waiting on our FHWA letter. We have submitted uh, the proposal to them or, or the application, they call it. And uh, again, if they stick with the current timeline of a review and approval process, it typically is about four months. So we're hoping to have something in that regard near the end of April or in May. Again, this is just our product information sheet. So again, you can see a pictorial depiction of the, the system. This just talks again about the, the features. 
And the, the length of the system at 22 feet, two and three quarter inch. Um, again, I am, I am pretty sure the pad on this is 54 inch wide because you'll see the base track width at 41 inches. Well, I'll try to verify that. I'm a little uncertain, uh, but uh, this just kind of summarizes the benefits and, and some simple instruction on it, all the key parts of it. So any questions or comments or feedback? Um, there's a, another question that came through. Um, can it be installed on asphalt or is it just concrete only application? At this point in time, it is for concrete applications. We view this unit primarily as a permanent uh, installation product, and we just recommend the, the concrete foundation for long-term use. If it is installed on asphalt, you know, it's likely, you know, not necessarily the first impact, but over time, it's going to require a full reinstallation, and you're going to have to kind of move away from the existing locations of asphalt anchors. But at this time, we don't plan to go through and do testing on asphalt to demonstrate that performance. Um, we like the idea of it being on a reinforced concrete pad. Perfect. Any other questions out there? Tim's got a, a question, he raised his hand. Tim Mokel. Yeah, go ahead. All right, it took you a second to, to find the control to unmute. Can you hear me, Mike? Yeah, yep, I can hear you. Hey, um, so I just had a number of, number of questions, so I figured it'd be easier to ask them. Um, you know, when I've been doing some reviews of other products, you know, we, we always ask about uh, curbs and like for the quad guard or the lead, you know, you say you follow the roadside design guide that it's not recommended, but you know, if it's replacing an existing attenuator that's already behind curb or certain situations, you may allow four inch mountable curves. Is, is, would that be a similar policy for the React? Uh, I would say most likely yes, but I would want to talk to our engineers about this product specifically. I know we've, we've said that and you are going to get a letter with stating that for the the quad guard family, this being a taller system, um, I think it would be even better suited for installations where there is a curb present. Uh, again, you know, the four inch mountable curb is uh, a requirement if there is a curb used, but uh, I would cer certainly think so, but I will double check. Yeah, I won't pin you down. Uh, I was just asking. Um, and then, um, I, I don't know. Is there plans for either a, a wide React uh, match coming out, or or is there any sort of transition to objects that are wider than the thirty inches at this time? Um, well, we're actually working right now on a design, and it's been completed to go out to a forty-inch wide hazard on a specific location down in Oregon. Um, as far as the wide React. I, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, or if it does, it would be several years down the road by the time we went through the entire development and testing process. Um, but again, right now, we can come off the back of the system with like a thribeam type guardrail system to get to a wider hazard. How wide we would want to go or what kind of taper we would allow right now we're looking at a five degree taper but the way those and if you saw those transition panels and i think i could probably go to a drawing that shows them so this transition panel you can see here you know in this case it's a transition as a protection against a reverse direction impact but we are looking at can you you know flare this out at a five degree taper you would have to support it with steel posts that are either driven or base plated posts. But we are looking at using this in some wider applications. But, you know, to get to 60 inch even, I, 
I don't know that that's practical. And we've got the Quad Guard Elite M10 that's a 69 inch wide system. So, um, and then you touched on it uh, br briefly, um, but but uh, could you uh, could you give us a, what maybe what a you think the unit cost is um, you know in, in dollars, and then maybe your typical anticipated repair cost for either head-on or side impacts. I realize that it would just be ball in the park figures because every every impact is different, but maybe just typical impacts and, and functions on maybe what you would typically see in a repair or repair cost, depending on the impact? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I would just throw out the $30,000 figure for this system. Um, and that's, you know, compared to just, and again, these are just rough numbers, but 20,000 maybe for a standard mash quad guard system. Um, and then our, our quad guard elite system lies somewhere in between, but this is, you know, the higher end of uh, the pricing. Um, but again, the good thing is when, when these are hit head on, we typically don't expect there to be any repair parts required. Um, in that redirective test that you saw, there were three of these uh, guides, these outer guides, and those cost uh, about $50 each. And then this cable bracket was also damaged. And, and these are, you know, just ballpark between $100 and $200, I believe. So your total repair cost is $250. And your total repair time on some impact like that would probably be, you know, 15 to 30 minutes, I would anticipate. Um, but that's, again, just kind of real ballpark uh, figures, but hopefully that gives you an idea of what you're looking for. Yeah. And then, and then the last thing is, is uh, Mike, I touched on it earlier, but uh, I'm not part of the um, uh, headquarter uh, materials, uh, you know, who runs the QPLs, but um, uh, just so everybody knows the QPL, they're, they're suspending new applications, I believe until July as uh, they, um, under, undergo some uh, um, per personnel changes over there. And, and so, you know, if designers want to use the React, uh, the React M, um, you know, that it may be submitted through a RAM process or maintenance could always ask uh, uh, order maintenance or us, you know, and then we could review, review it, uh, you know, a little more in depth to ensure, but um, we, we touched on it earlier, Mike, but, you know, so even if it's not on the QPL for a certain amount of time, it could still make its way onto projects. Um, and then, and then last question I had, um, are these available now, um, or, or is it in the near future? And then, you know, can people start buying it through Coral or, or through Trinity? Um, and have other states started using this? You know, to my knowledge, we don't have any uh, installed. Uh, I know one of our distributors in, uh, I believe it's Tennessee, ordered a truckload of these um, because they expect them to, to start being used more uh, frequently. Um, so it's just started. We do manufacture it. We are able to probably provide a system in a three to four week lead time right now just because we're just getting going with them. Um, I will let you know, and this is just something that we decided to do, every unit that we crash tested, and there's eight crash tests total with this system uh, for the matrix, uh, you know, for FHWA eligibility, every one of those was manufactured at our city facility. So we, we want to make sure that what we manufacture is what was tested. So we, we are set up to manufacture this and, and the lead time again is about three to four weeks. Um, we're working with Oregon. I hope to have one installed down there, but uh, you know, it, it's early in the process. We've just submitted it to them as well. So they, uh, they haven't completed their review. So it's kind of a, a rush if you will, but uh, yeah. So that's kind of where we're at right now. It is available. Thanks Mike. I just wanted to point out here, and sorry for stating 
I, I thought it was 54. We, we're at 48 inches wide on the, the concrete foundation pad. So that's, that's good. It'll help it fit in more areas. And uh, just wanted to verify that more for myself, I guess. But um, if, if, well, I got you guys. And because I saw Ron was on the call, um, I just wanted to point out that this was another one that we didn't get to the uh, QPL review process before they closed it, um, where I believe the REACT M has actually been submitted and has a, assigned a submittal number and everything. So I think the REACT M will go through. Um, but we have the Quad Guard M wide. And I know this, you know, essentially this type of system has been. Uh, asked about in the past. Uh, it's got a smaller footprint at just over 22 feet and uh, it protects hazards 69 inch wide. So this is another product that we've done full testing on and we actually do have an FHWA letter. So again, if you were looking to use this product, uh, we could certainly manufacture and supply it uh, perhaps through the RAM process as well. So I just wanted to let people on the call know that that is uh, available and, and we are manufacturing these products. Well, any other questions or comments? And Mike, the other question, I had one question for you. So when you're looking at repair cost and maintenance, um, the residual capacity piece of the React M that can actually help you avoid having to take out, um, like rent a TMA truck for like a week or two weeks prior to getting the product in, the residual capacity could potentially hold another hit to the unit while you're waiting on parts, correct? You wouldn't have to take a, a TMA truck out there to, to block it off? Well, it, it all depends on the site location. You know, I think uh, it's imperative that, you know, the DOT does everything safely. And, you know, sometimes when these are impacted, they will, you know, when crash cushions are impacted, especially when they compress and don't have any ability to self-restore, they'll park a TMA out there um, in front of them. If there's room, a lot of these are in narrow gore areas where there's no room for that. And, Unfortunately, there's been situations I know of down in California where they they weren't able to put anything in front of them and the system sat collapsed for over, you know, two weeks and then were impacted again before they were reset. And uh, that resulted in a fatal collision. And, it, you know, depending on the system and what it takes to repair or replace it, I know in both cases down there, they were damaged to the point where they weren't... Uh, repairable so they needed to be replaced and that's why it was taking so long apparently to get out there and and put in a new unit and i do also just want to point out those weren't systems that we manufacture but uh in any event yeah it's you know it, it's really a hard thing to pinpoint and say they they can or can't do this or that because each site's different but uh you know typically you're going to see these reset to the point where they have residual capacity and if you aren't able to get out there and repair it right away, uh, especially if it's a, a different type of system that collapses, then this, this has a lot of benefits over that type of system. Perfect. Thank you. So with that, any other questions we can answer for you? Okay, Mike. Well, thank you for, for coming in and putting this together. And thanks, Jamie, for, for being part of this as well. And just so you know, Jamie, Bernstein does deal with all the maintenance sheds in, res in response to parts and pieces for pretty much all your guardrail out there and crash cushions. So um, again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. All right. Thank you. Thanks for uh, putting this together. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Yeah, right. thanks for coming. We appreciate it. And yeah, don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right. Have a good day.